think we'll get started. Um, we're, we're here at the end of the week, uh, Friday at Mises University. Uh, it seems uh, everyone survived through successive days of, of, of lectures. So here we are uh, at the end. Um, and uh, the subject of today's talk is cronyism in America, which could pretty much be about anything, right? I could talk about any time period in American history, any policy, et cetera. And uh, yeah, we could find some cronyism in it. Um, uh, but what I thought I would talk about is a case study from my book. Uh, so last year when I spoke about uh, cronyism, I gave an overall outline of my book, Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. Uh, this is the first of many books that I've been, um, um, I hope to write on cronyism. I was originally supposed to write one book on cronyism, but uh, there's just so much information had to turn into multiple books, right? So uh, this reminds me of of, um, uh, on Twitter, someone mentioned that, uh, well, hopefully, uh, Patrick uh, Newman, when you get to the, the, the modern era, you'll be able to talk about uh, Nancy Pelosi and cronyism. And I said, well, uh, Nancy Pelosi and cronyism, that in itself would be a multi-volume series. <laughs> so I, I don't know exactly how I'm going to tackle that subject. It could be, could be a treatise in its own right. Um, so what I want to do uh, is, like I said, talk about a case study and, well, why, why, do we, why do I want to talk about the past when there's so much to discuss about the present? Um, well, you know, my philosophy on this is that, well, in order to understand the present, you have to understand the past, all right? So in order to write a history of modern cronyism, you have to see how all the threads uh, tie together, all, the, all the, the various narrative strands tie together. But, but more fundamentally, I think understanding the past allows us to better understand the present, in particular, to see various patterns of cronyism. Right to see, okay, how exactly, uh, and I'll define cronyism uh, in, a, in a little bit, how exactly various special interest policies uh, really um, work throughout history so we can better understand them, right? This, and also to look at uh, patterns of reform. When was it possible uh, to, to actually reform uh, crony policies, reform the government? Is, is there something we can learn from history? Okay, so... Uh, you know, the, the first thing we have to uh, tackle is uh, what exactly do I mean by cronyism? Hopefully many of you have heard of cronyism, uh, crony capitalism, uh, the, the, the word the, the crony, uh, cronies, and, and so on. Uh, this is a very, um, you know, there, there, there are many definitions, and I've stuck with what I think is the best definition, which is policies that benefit special interests at the public's expense. Right, so we think of a tariff that protects manufacturers at the expense of consumers uh, and uh, other firms and so on. Uh, so there was a, a critical review of my book uh, that, that came out, and one of their first uh, criticisms was that, well, this definition of cronyism apparently is, is unique, because normally cronyism just refers to hiring uh, you know, your, 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 uh, your supporters to various government jobs. So if, if with a definition of, 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 of cronyism like this, well, then uh, the, the, the reviewer said, well, everything's crony. And I said, well, yeah, everything is crony, <laughs> right? This isn't, this isn't a problem with the definition. This is a problem of the world we live in. Yeah, everything's special interest policies, right? So <laughs> I think that it's a great definition. The fact that, well, it means, uh, you know, all throughout American history, there was cronyism. That's not, a, that's not a weakness of my definition. I think that's a strength. But, you know, this is a, it's, it's a very important um, subject to study because very rarely are policies advocated to be benefit special interests, right? You never hear of a politician saying, well, I want to support higher tariffs because I want to protect uh, companies that I've invested in. You don't, you don't really hear that. That's not a good election strategy. You usually, usually hear something much more grandiose, well, to protect the public. Everything's always justified in terms of the public interest. And it's the task of the historian, the past and the, the present, to sort of uh, sift through the lies uh, and, the, and the propaganda and actually see what were the real motivations for various policies. OK, so I, I didn't answer my question. I, you know, what the, at least your question is to, to what the case study is. Uh, and you know, in order to build up to that somewhat momentously, um, I, you know, we live in a world of constant cronyism, the modern era, nothing seems to change. 
no matter the party or the people in power, right? It's just uh, one group of elites versus another group of elites. Uh, we have to choose between uh, two power-hungry groups. Uh, as Murray Rothbard would often say before presidential elections, you know, one of these bozos is going to be lording over us for the next four years, right? So that's kind of it's kind of how we 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 usually feel uh, in the modern era. Um, and you might ask, was it always like this? Is there any example of cronyism uh, going away? Uh, can we learn from it, right? Can, particularly, can we learn you know how to reform the government or strategies for reform, right? This builds into my uh, previous comment about we want to understand uh, the past so we can better understand the present. And I say yes. There's a, there's a great story of cronyism that I, I, I enjoy talking about, uh, and I think it's one of the most important case studies from my book, and we can learn from it. Uh, and it's also just a very interesting uh, topics, just simply because the, the Federal Reserve and inflation is so big on all of our minds today. And this is, this is the story of Andrew Jackson in the Jacksonians fight against the Second Bank of the United States. I think the Jacksonians were the most successful uh, libertarian political party. They weren't perfect by any means, but they were better than the Jeffersonians in terms of actually getting stuff done, better than the Cleveland Democrats better than the old right of the 1930s and 40s, they actually managed to accomplish a surprising amount in about 15 years or so, right? And one of their most important accomplishments was, was tackling the, uh, the central bank. You know, they actually got rid of a central bank. This wasn't, well, we're going to institute a new monetary rule or we're going to appoint someone better in charge. No, we're actually just going to get rid of it, right? And what I want to emphasize is... Something that we can learn from the Jacksonians and why they were so successful is that they attacked cronyism. They spearheaded the reform movement through the executive branch. Right? The Jacksonians were, were very prominent in transforming the executive from a position that fought cronyism to now a position that attacked cronyism. Because it's very, very hard to reform government through the legislative branch. You just can't do it. Right? Even if we had Ron Paul in charge, right, he became president in 2008, 2012, the vast majority of his reform would have to be through the executive branch, particularly through vetoes, foreign policy, you know, taking troops out of other countries, rotation in office, uh, and so on. So it's this reform through the executive that I think applies to the modern era at the federal level and also at the state level, where various governors... Uh, over the past couple of years have been able to stop government intervention and cronyism through their executive position, okay? All right, so in order to talk about this, this great bank war of the 1830s, uh, we have to at least talk about the origins of the bank, right? So we've had, uh, we technically had two central banks uh, b before um, the second bank of the United States. We had the Bank of North America, and we had the first bank of the United States. For a variety of reasons, both of those went away. Uh, we don't need to get into that. Uh, we can just start our story by saying, well, at the War of 1812, which started in 1812, uh, and if we remember Tom uh, DiLorenzo's great talk yesterday, it was a, a war of aggression. We were trying to conquer Canada as well as Florida. Um, the, the, the ruling party in power, which had uh, originally been the Jeffersonian Republicans, but they had been thoroughly corrupted by power. These are the National Republicans. Um, they try to establish the old Federalist program, so the old Hamiltonian big government program uh, that many Americans uh, fought against in the 1790s. Uh, one of the central features of this crony Federalist program was a central bank. Okay, so to have a bank that's privileged by the federal government uh, to coordinate monetary expansion across the country, to uh, strengthen bank cartels, to nationalize the monetary system. And this bank was chartered in 1816. So this is the second bank of the United States, uh, and it has various special privileges, okay? So various crony uh, features. One, it's got a 20-year monopoly charter, okay? So Congress gave it a 20-year monopoly charter, saying we won't charter another bank during this time. And this bank had the ability to branch across state lines. It was the only bank that could do this, at least given the power to do this by the federal government, something that's very important, right? So this charter 
uh, it was basically a license. Right? And licenses, though they're justified in terms of the public interest, well, we need to protect uh, safety standards or quality of the product, et cetera, it's just crony. It's a way of restricting competition um, and boosting prices. So on top of this monopoly charter, the Treasury also deposited the vast majority of its money at the bank in its various branches. So this was an enormous subsidy. The, the government at the time collected money uh, largely through tariffs, uh, also land sales, et cetera. So these were various taxes. And it would store most of its money at the bank. Right? And this would be in the form of gold uh, or various state bank notes and deposits. And then the second bank of the United States could take this gold um, or these uh, notes and deposits and use them as the basis for its own credit expansion. Okay, um, this is a, a fairly big subsidy, right? It's the equivalent of if, if Congress uh, chooses some restaurant in Washington, D.C., and it says, well, every Friday, uh, all of Congress is going to go to this one restaurant, right? And they're all going to spend money at this pizzeria, and they're going to use the taxpayer dollars uh, at this pizzeria. You know, that would be a pretty big crony privilege, right? It would be a nice subsidy. And I'm, I'm sure these restaurants do exist in Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> Uh, one, one final uh, special privilege was that the government owned uh, one-fifth of this corporation. All right? uh, it had one-fifth uh, of the stock ownership, um, and this, again, provided it with a nice subsidy. All right? So it was a close government-bank alliance. All right? This was a corporation chartered by Congress, um, and it had uh, very big special privileges that the public... Uh, soon came, soon started to despise for various reasons that we'll get into. All right. So after this bank is chartered, um, the 1820s is often known as the era of good feelings. Uh, that's not really an accurate uh, description or a, a title for the, uh, the period. A far more accurate title, which has been given by historian Robert Bramini, is the era of corruption. All right. Uh, everyone was corrupt. Right? All the ruling politicians in power at the federal and state levels, they were routinely screwing the public, dipping their hands into the uh, taxpayers' uh, monies, uh, granting out various special privileges. And unsurprisingly, this occurred in the monetary sphere. So the bank opened up for business in 1817 after the War of 1812 is over. And uh, the bank, unsurprisingly, was very corrupt. Okay? The directors of the bank particularly the directors of the Baltimore branch, uh, illegally, uh, they, they loan money to themselves without collateral. So this is against the bank's uh, rules. Right? And how they're able to do this is, well, they, they bribe the bank president. So, all right, well, that takes care of that. Uh, they're able to uh, push for the bank to increase credit expansion, and they're funneling this credit expansion to themselves. It's quite, uh, it's quite fascinating, the, the history of the Baltimore branch. They were really able to engineer this because uh, they were able to choose the bank president. And how they chose the bank president was they managed to get around the, the bylaws of the bank, saying that, well, each shareholder could only exercise a certain amount of votes. And what they did was they just simply um, they, they, they collected all of the, 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 sh the shareholders, or they, they basically voted through proxies, right? So some of these... Uh, individuals who loan themselves money controlled about you know 30 times as many uh, uh, shares as they as, as they should have been able to right so it's a thoroughly crony they're doing this to benefit themselves and of course when there's cronyism in the monetary sphere there's uh, an inflationism right it's very inflationary it's, it's very expansionary uh, the central bank uh, during this time period in the years after the war of 1812 up to about 1819, they expanded its deposits by 57% in a couple of years. That's, that's a lot, okay? Um, it's almost like 2022 levels, or 2021 levels. There's it's, it's, it's a lot for the time period. And the total money supply uh, rose about 25%, okay? So over a, a short period, uh, this huge burst in credit expansion, okay? So as we know from the theory we learned earlier in this week, uh, this credit expansion caused an unsustainable boom in farm improvements, right? Uh, land speculation, buildings, turnpike construction, so various types of roads, ships, uh, slaves, and steamboats. 
Okay, these were the higher order capital goods uh, that were sensitive to interest rate changes. And this is where a new investment was channeled. Okay, so we started to see this big boom. People are going into the West. The West at the time referred to the Midwest, uh, around the Mississippi River, in Alabama and Mississippi, the Southwest, et cetera. So you saw this huge uh, expansion develop after the war, and it was supported by uh, credit expansion. Okay, so this is, this is America's first business cycle. It happened about 200 years ago. All right. Well, the problem is the good times can't last forever. In the late 1818, the central bank suffers a gold outflow. All right, why does it suffer a gold outflow? Well, we remember earlier in the week the adverse clearing mechanism. All right, the, the banks, the, the, the central bank's liabilities are still redeemable in gold. All right, so as this bank is expanding credit, uh, its gold reserves are starting to decrease, particularly by foreigners uh, presenting the uh, obligations. They're not confident in the American economy. Right. The state banks were working with the uh, second bank of the United States, so they agreed uh, to cartelize with them. But again, there's always external pressure, as I mentioned, and uh, it starts to experience a gold outflow. So what does the central bank, what does the second bank of the United States do? Well, it contracts credit. It severely cur curtails its loans, right? This leads to a sharp decrease in the money supply, and this precipitates our first major business cycle. There was a, a downturn in the late 1790s, but this is really our first business cycle, our first recession, the Panic of 1819, which hits the economy um, in early 1819. All right, so this, this big downturn. And something that's very important to note is people perceived a very serious depression in the years that followed. Why? Well, because prices collapsed 31%. Right, from 1819 to about 1821, 1822, prices plummeted 31%. Right? So this is, a, this is a, a very big decline. And people say that, well, if prices are falling, that must mean output's falling. Right? So if prices are falling 31%, that must, must mean output's falling by 31%. Right? In reality, this depression is actually fairly mild. Right? You can look at some aggregate statistics. I talk about this more in my book, but it's just important to note. Uh, from about 1819 to 1824, nominal GDP per person, so spending declined 10% um, uh, during this time period, while real GDP per person increased 8%. Okay, this is a nominal illusion. The fact that uh, we're spending 10% less doesn't mean that output's necessarily declining by 10%, right? Because falling prices do not imply a depression, right? Uh, Prices can fall, but that can be a reflection of an increased supply of goods. Right? It's also a reflection of the economy correcting itself. Because while there were many debates about what the country should do, right? uh, should it practice expansionary monetary policy, expansionary fiscal policy at the federal and state levels, et cetera, many of these debates are recounted in Murray Rothbard's book, The Panic of 1819, which I spoke about yesterday. Overall, the country practiced a policy of laissez-faire. Right? So the best way to uh, recover from a boom-bust cycle is the government gets out of the way, just allows the market to reallocate resources. But what's very important about this is the people were mad. They were very furious at this because they thought that there was a severe depression and they blamed it on the bank. Right? So uh, famous economist William Go uh, Gouge later said, or Gouge later said, the bank was saved, but the people were ruined. All right, this is a, a famous quote, right? And this, this panic of 1819, why it's important, it inspired the Jacksonians in the 1820s. Um, Post-panic, there was a huge increase in hard money thought, right? So anti-bank uh, credit expansion, pro-gold standard, uh, this type of uh, thought had weakened during the War of 1812. And something that's very fascinating from an Austrian perspective, is that this hard money thought uh, in America was, was heavily influenced by newly translated European economists, uh, particularly French economists, proto-Austrians, as Murray Rothbard has documented in his uh, History of Economic Thought. All right. So John Baptiste Say, uh, one of these newly translated economists, hopefully we've all heard of Say, right, in Say's Law, Etc. Uh, he was very uh, anti-bank credit expansion, or at least 
Um, he was pro-free banking, pro-100% reserves, depending on he had various reforms. He was against government uh, subsidization of the monetary uh, sector. Um, his book becomes a mainstream college textbook. Right? So just imagine that. Right? Back in the day, you're going to college. Colleges at the time were not these large government-funded research universities. They were small liberal arts colleges. The professor uh, usually taught a variety of classes. Uh, and Say's book, Before the Civil War, was one of the leading college textbooks, right? Uh, it's just <laughs> interesting to note, okay? Times have changed, unfortunately. And what's also important is that influenced by uh, these theories and just the, the general uh, dispensation of the, um, uh, of the post-depression era, politicians start to attack the central bank's uh, monopoly privileges saying, hey, wait a second, this bank caused this huge hardship. Why did we charter this institution in the first place? Uh, this seems a very a very crony, very corrupt. And we've got many, many figures here that we'll be talking about for the remainder of the talk. We've got a young Andrew Jackson, uh, a dashing figure, the former general in the War of 1812. He was a politician from Tennessee. He became very anti-bank during this time period, very anti-central bank, very anti-fractional reserve banking. Um, and, and we'll see how this influenced his later fight against the uh, bank later on. You've got Martin Van Buren. This is a, an actual photograph of him. He's one of my favorite presidents, one of Murray Rothbard's favorite presidents. Uh, he was a New York senator at the time, so he was a senator in New York in the U.S. Congress. Um, and he starts to become very hard money as a result of the panic. We've got uh, James K. Polk. Uh, from Tennessee, so one of Andrew Jackson's right-hand hand, hand men. Uh, if Andrew Jackson was known as Old Hickory, Polk was known as Young Hickory, uh, fighting monetary privileges in uh, Tennessee. And then we've got one of my favorite characters, uh, Thomas Hart, quote, Old Bullion Benton, who was one of Missouri's uh, first senators. Uh, what's fascinating about Benton is that he became a staunch ally of Jackson in the 1820s, but during the War of 1812, he actually got into a duel with Jackson, him and his brother. Uh, it, you, you can read this. It was, it was almost something that came from some sort of wild, wild west movie because they're in an inn. Uh, they're firing at each other. Uh, Jesse Benton, uh, Benton's uh, brother, shoots Jackson in the arm, right? He shoots him in the arm. Benton gets stabbed like five times. Jackson's on this bed. He's bleeding on this mattress. Uh, he keeps the bullet in his arm for 20 years. We'll actually see how this plays plays into later. So just, <laughs> it's a little odd, I, you know, I guess I'll say that because um, the most important thing I want you to understand is that even if you get into a fight someone, you know, you, you fight someone, there's, there's a knife or there's a gun involved, you can still be their best friend later on as long as you both hate central banks, which is <laughs> exactly what happened, right? Because Benton in the 1820s and the 1830s, he kind of becomes Jackson's muscle in the Senate. It's, <laughs> it's really funny. Because uh, he shot at the guy, right? Usually, if someone shoots at you, you're not really good friends with them later on. But uh, when you're trying to fight monetary cronyism, you're going to recruit all the allies you can get. Um, okay. But the central bank has powerful friends, right? The, the central bank has the cronies. Uh, recruited Hamiltonian intellectuals. Uh, Loan the money to periodicals in return for their support. Okay, this is... Uh, for example, the National Intelligence Service, the New York Times of the day, okay, they received loans from the bank. And in their articles, they supported the bank. Oh, okay. I wonder where that came from. You know, is it because they, they, they earnestly believe this is in the benefit of the public, you know, this will benefit the public, or because they're getting money from the bank, right? There's a new bank president, Nicholas Biddle. Uh, it was a very thorough Hamiltonian um, he started to take charge of the Second Bank of the United States in the 1820s, and he wants to uh, nationalize the country's uh, monetary system, sort of bring all the state banks under the control of the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, Nicholas Biddle would always argue that his policies were not inflationary. He was just trying to control the, uh, the money supply, improve economic activity, and so on. And he started to become Jackson's you know, worst enemy, you know, somebody you just, you just really despised. So I've got a, got a picture from Biddle, of Biddle here. Uh, that's, oh, wait, no, sorry, that's not Biddle. There's Biddle, okay. Uh, there's, there, there's some similarities between them, uh, but this is, this is actually Nicholas Biddle, 
and he was a, seen as like a, a, a protege of Hamilton. He never really met him, but he was, he was sort of seen as the 1820s, 1830s version of Alexander Hamilton. They've also, the bank also has other friends, uh, particularly politicians in Congress who will defend the bank. So why are they defending the bank? Well, because the bank loaned them money, okay? Uh, the Federal Reserve can't directly loan money to individuals, but the second bank of the United States could. And it loaned money to Thomas DiLorenzo's two favorite politicians, Henry Clay and Daniel Webster. Uh, we've heard him talk about Henry Clay uh, before. Um, Webster was extremely corrupt. Yeah, he was a prominent politician from Massachusetts, a senator, and he would, he, he would get a retainer from the bank, right? Basically saying, look, uh, we'll, we'll keep you on our, our, our payroll. You got to defend the bank. And we have letters from Webster writing to Nicholas Biddle and other central bank officials saying, well, I want my retainer, quote, renewed or refreshed as usual, saying, look, if you want me to defend you in Congress, you got to pay up. I want my money, right? Uh, that's, that, 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 that's pretty bad. Uh, but, well, he defended it because he was getting paid from the bank. So here is Henry Clay, um, very prominent big government politician at the time, uh, very pro-central banking. And this is Daniel Webster. We can just look at these pictures, and we, we know they're bad people, right? I mean, <laughs> just, just look at them. Look at those eyes. They're, you know, they're up to no good, right? Um, it's just, just, just bad people, I guess. No. Um, okay. So a, a big turning point or a big uh, catalyst moment for the Jacksonians is in the election of 1824, uh, when Jackson defeats Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, uh, John Adams' son. Uh, John Quincy Adams, interestingly enough, owned stock in the Second Bank of the United States. And interestingly enough, he supported the Second Bank of the United States. Would you look at that? In the popular and the electoral vote. Uh, but he didn't have majorities. He had pluralities. So that meant we had to go to an overtime election uh, where the House of Representatives decided on who would be the winner. And Adams works with Speaker of the House Clay to steal the election. Basically, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Right. Clay says, I'll make you president now, and you make me secretary of state. And back then, secretary of state was the most reliable stepping stone into the White House. Basically, all of the former presidents, or many of them, um, were previously secretary of state. And this is something that really shocked the country. This happened on the first round of balloting in the House, and Jackson was absolutely furious because right, he just he, he didn't like how all of these deals were made before the election, excuse me, before that the, the, uh, the House election. Um, and Jackson fumed, and he's got this great quote. He says, the Judas of the West has closed the contract. He's referring to Henry Clay of Kentucky. Uh, and received the 30 pieces of silver. His end will be the same, right? So <laughs> again, I'm talking about a man who got into a duel with someone who's killed people in duels. Uh, you, you generally don't want to upset him. And what really rankled Jackson and many Westerners was Henry Clay got the House delegation of Kentucky, the Kentucky delegation, to vote for Jackson, even though the official record showed that Jackson, uh, excuse me, that um, Adams did not receive a single vote in Kentucky, right? Uh, there were actually some votes later, but really this was seen as a, a, big, a big smack in the face, right? And this, is, this, 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 this upsets Jackson, which is something a uh, life tip don't do. Um, so the revolution of 1828 happens, and most notably, Martin Van Buren creates the Libertarian Democratic Party. Yes, this is the exact same Democratic Party of today. It's the same party structure, uh, the party structure, the Democrats created by the Jacksonians, but very different um, uh, policies they supported, very uh, small government, anti-central banking, anti-protective tariffs, anti-internal improvements, limited foreign policy, anti-national debt. Uh, it was a great party, and this is Van Buren's, uh, uh, goes to Van Buren's credit. He, he literally forges this, this Democratic Party in a couple of years, and he decides to make Jackson the charismatic standard bearer. Uh, Jackson was this, this, this general in the War of 1812. He basically won our only, major, the, the, our only major victory in the War of 1812, the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, and he, he's, he's just seen as he's, he's, this, he's this charming general, uh, and Van, he also shares uh, you know, similar philosophy with Van Buren. And in particular, what they decide they'll do, to do is they're going to fight congressional cronyism with the presidential veto. Right? The presidential veto, when it was designed by the Federalists at the U.S. Constitutional Convention, they 
created it to sort of defend cronyism in case Congress ever got to reform incline. Right? But what Jackson and Van Buren decided to do is they say, hey, wait, we can veto uh, various uh, policies proposed or various policies enacted by Congress. Right? So turning the presidential veto, transforming it into this anti-crony sword, uh, well, the credit goes to Jackson and Van Buren. Okay? This is re executive reform. Right? This is reform through the executive. Uh, and this has really been the only... <laughs> effective way that throughout history we've been able to accomplish various reforms. Of course, Congress can get stuff done, uh, but they usually need the prodding or the support of the executive. Something very um, crucial to keep in mind for the modern era. Though so triumphantly, Jackson smashes Adams in the rematch. Okay, so he, he throws at Adams, gets kicked out of office. Jackson becomes president. Uh, the Jacksonians ride into office. And the question is, well, does Jackson embark upon monetary reform? Jefferson attacked uh, the central bank in the 1790s, but when he entered office, he, he, he moderated, right? Uh, would the same thing happen to Jackson? Well, actually, no, okay? And instead, there's, there's this um, huge so-called bank war, this momentous bank war where at the beginning of Jackson's first presidential term, he, he starts attacking the central bank, right? And this is a, this is a very surprising. No, a lot of people didn't expect this, or a lot of people thought that Jackson uh, wouldn't actually do this, uh, but it occurs. So the opening artillery fire, as it was, as it was called back in the day, um, it, it started in, at the beginning of Jackson's presidential term when various economists, William Goge and Condi Rago, uh, Jacksonian-affiliated economists, some of them were direct, directly linked to the party, uh, Goge was, uh, Rago was not. Uh, they criticized the banking system as, quote, the foundation of artificial inequality of wealth and thereby of artificial inequality of power. What's very important is artificial. Right? They're not attacking the banking system. They're not anti-capitalist. They're attacking a privileged banking system. They're attacking a banking system that's artificial because it's been privileged with various policies um, allowing banks to suspend specie payments, governments owning, uh, partially owning the banks, uh, so on and so forth, All right? So this is, uh, the economists are getting involved, uh, at least the good ones. And Jackson's first congressional address in December 1829, uh, he declares the central bank's existence, quote, well questioned by a large portion of our fellow citizens. So he's saying, well, why do we have a central bank? Can you imagine a president today in their uh, address to Congress. They're questioning uh, the Federal Reserve. They're saying its existence is well questioned by a large portion of our fellow citizens. I mean, this would cause the, the financial press and uh, the, the establishment to go totally apoplectic. They would flip out. They would say, how could you do this? And the exact thing happened uh, about 200 years ago, right? Um, so Nicholas Biddle, for one, as we'll talk about, was, was very worried about this. Um, he had actually voted for Jackson in 1828, partially to mollify him, to sort of pacify him. He wanted to cozy up to Jackson. And in particular, why is Biddle stunned? Well, if you remember, I said the bank had a 20-year charter, right? 1816, it was chartered. It has to renew its charter in 1836, all right? Uh, so now Biddle's worried. He's saying, well, uh, this could, uh, if Jackson gets reelected, this could potentially pose a problem for the central bank. Right? So Biddle is upset. And what Biddle does is he counterattacks through the, the time-honored method of, pro, of, of propaganda and bribery. Right? So he, he sends his congressional allies various pro-central banking information, uh, sends them various uh, pamphlets on central banking. Uh, he loans money to congressmen to defend the central bank, et cetera. Uh, something else that I think it's very important to note is, well, he recruits his own intellectuals. And these are the various court intellectuals Rothbard uh, would frequently criticize. Uh, he enlists the academic American Quarterly Review, so a very prominent um, journal at the time period. Right? Uh, one of the fields of study was economics. And this was owned by a recipient of, well, loans from the Second Bank of the United States. So, wow, would, would you look at that? It's, it's very interesting. I wonder why it's very pro-central bank. Um, he corrupts newspapers with money. So notably, there was the Courier and Inquirer, uh, a pro-Jacksonian newspaper. 
And what Biddle did is, well, he gave it a $15,000 loan. And then this newspaper becomes very anti-Jackson and, and pro-central banking. Right? It's, it's, it's funny how money works like that. Um, so it's, it's important to note, the main thing is that, well, from 1829 to 1832, Biddle spends about fifty to $100,000 on pamphlets. Uh, he lends $100,000 to various owners of newspapers, and he loans uh, congressmen about $100,000 to $200,000. Right? These, these might look like small numbers now, right? but that's, that was actually a good chunk of change back in the day. So Biddle, Biddle's not an idiot. He knows what he's got to do, and he's He's got to he's got to renew and refresh some retainers, so to speak, right? Uh, he's got to get Webster on his side, okay? And Webster was on his side because he was got his retainer uh, renewed. Um, <clears throat> but the siege continues uh, very notably in 1830. Jackson proposes a gold warehouse, okay? So he says, "This is the monetary reform I want to try to um, embark upon." Uh, quote: A bank without power to make loans. And though issuing no paper would check the issues of the state banks by taking their notes so long as they continued to be redeemed in specie. All right, this is the independent treasury. All right, Jackson is saying, well, we want to have the bank uh, not connected with the government anymore. The, we want the government, the treasury, to now keep all of its money in its own vaults. And in particular, to keep only gold and silver in its vaults. They didn't want to privilege any bank, uh, any bank's notes or deposits by accepting it. It's very hard money. It's very magnificent reform, which we actually later uh, created, uh, which is great. Um, and Senator Thomas Benton in the Senate, J uh, Jackson's muscle in the Senate, he, he blasts the bank as a privileged monopoly unbecoming of a, quote, confederacy of states. Right? And so Benton's, Jackson's uh, most favored, uh, you know, like a senator, he's very supporting him uh, tremendously. And what's great is that in early 1832, as Jackson is stepping up uh, his, his, his attack on the bank, um, his, his arm is starting to, to really hurt him. I don't know, probably because there's been a bullet in there for 20 years. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. Uh, but he gets the bullet finally removed. And then he says, let's go kill a central bank, right? He finally gets that, gets that, that bullet removed. And now he's, he's ready to go for the jugular. So the nefarious Henry Clay steps in, right? Because politicians, they're always, you know, many of them, they're up to no good. And, and Clay wants to defeat Jackson in the 1832 election. Like, Clay still wants to be president. This is something Clay desperately wanted and he never got throughout his whole life. Just a, he went to the grave wishing he was president. He was nominee multiple times by the opposition Whig party, but he never got the coveted prize. And uh, his running mate in 1832 was... <laughs> a former shareholder and director of the Second Bank of the United States. Well, would you look at that? That's a little interesting, I guess. I don't know. I'm not going to you know, bring any you know, tiny uh, threads here. I'll, I'll leave that to the audience. Um, and one thing Clay does is he urges Biddle to push for an early recharter before the election. So what he says is, don't wait till 1836. This is what you got to do. Push for it before the presidential election in 1832, because here's how it's going to go down. This is what Clay told Biddle. He says, if Jackson actually vetoes the bank, He's going to lose. He's going to, it's going to seem so ridiculous. The public's going to get, get upset. And if he doesn't veto the recharter, he's still going to lose because now he's going to look very weak. Uh, he clearly, his bark was bigger than his bite and the public is going to vote him out of office. So this is a, this is a win-win according to Henry Clay, right? And Clay's main rationale here or his main motivation is that, well, if he loses, that means I win. Right, because the 1832 election was Clay versus Jackson, so now this this monetary reform is getting caught up in the in the politics of the time, in the election cycle of the time, much like some of our current monetary debates. Right, uh, important to note. So what what happens in 1832? Right, this this bank veto is excuse me the the uh, the bank um, uh, the bank charter is 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 up uh, in front of uh, in front of Congress, and Congress again they've been bribed by Biddle. Many of them had formerly worked for the bank. They've gotten loans from the bank, etc. Uh, they passed the recharter bill in July, July 1832. Right here we are at Mises U in in 2022. Right, and that was so many years ago. Uh, I can't do the math off the top of my head because I'm an Austrian economist, but uh, we know it was, it was yeah, the timing is perfect in this, right? It was, this whole thing was planned. Um, and Biddle triumphantly appears 
uh, before Congress and he hosts a party after. Uh, and I, I just remember reading this in a book and I'm thinking, how could he, right? You know, you think of this classic DC party. He's got this huge gala and everything. He says, look, the bank charter has been passed. Um, but Jackson had, had long ago decided to veto what he called the corrupting monster, right? So he, he already knew he was going to do this. He's like, no, nah, Biddle's going down. That's, that, that's what he said, all right? So Jackson, he's, he's I'm going I'm to veto this. And there's a great quote. It was right around when Congress was passing the, 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 the bank bill. And Van Buren goes to see Jackson. And Jackson, he's, he looks very distraught. He's very distressed. And he says to Van Buren, he goes, the bank, Mr. Van Buren, is trying to kill me, but I will kill it, right? And it's very dramatic. I mean, well, apparently when he said it was less dramatic, but I'm still going to sound dramatic because it's a great quote. And this is how I imagine him. You know, he's, he's, he's slamming his fist on the table. He's, he's, he's sort of his old General Jackson self. And he's going, nope, it's going down, I'm killing the bank. <laughs> this is uh, it's a great political cartoon at the time. Jackson frequently thought of the bank as this hydra. It was this multi-headed hydra. Uh, it's got all these tentacles. It's corrupting state banks. It's corrupting Congress. It's corrupting politicians, newspapers, et cetera. And there's Jackson. Uh, he's got his sword, and he's, he's fighting the bank, right? Um, he's, he's fighting the hydra, which I, I just think this is a great cartoon. Uh, it, it, it's a great political cartoon. It just, it just shows Jackson as how I think he wants to be remembered. Um, uh, or at least how, how, how I want to remember Jackson. So, you know, that, that, that's, 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 what, that's what's going to go on. Uh, so Jackson, he vetoes the bank. He, he, he surprisingly vetoes the bank. He says, nope, not getting the recharter. Uh, you're out of luck. And he transforms the presidential veto, right? He technically had vetoed a very prominent internal improvements bill in 1830. Uh, but this is really a, a big one. Wow, he actually vetoed a, a, a bank recharter. Right, this is now made it seem the Jacksonians were, they really meant business. And his veto said, when the, quote, rich and powerful, end quote, scheme to devise, quote, artificial, again, remember, artificial, distinctions to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges, special privileges, the public can complain of the injustice. Right, so he's saying, well, we got monetary cronyism. Yeah, the public has a right to complain. And this is very, very, very important uh, veto. In fact, I think it's the best presidential reform against cronyism. And what's fascinating to note is that the veto was written by an economist, Amos Kendall, a very prominent Jacksonian, right? And if you've read Murray Rothbard's History of Economic Thought, Kendall actually makes a little bit of a showing. Um, in the 1810s, he had written some articles for a newspaper kind of sketching out the basics of the marginal utility doctrine. So I just think that's really cool. You got this proto-Austrian, and here he is more or less writing the veto to get rid of a central bank. Coincidence? I think not, right? And as a prominent historian has said, because sometimes people criticize the Jacksonian, saying, well, Jackson was just against a bank. He was just against banking. Well, historian Donald Coles, um, uh, a prominent biographer of Amos Kendall, said, quote, the veto is an attack on government privilege, not, as some have suggested, on capitalism. That's very important. The veto is an attack on government privilege, not, as some have suggested, on capitalism. Okay? Uh, so it's a fight against cronyism. It's not just me. This is, this is what the Jacksonians were actually doing. And Biddle was furious. He, he described Jackson's decision as, as anarchy. Um, and to make things even worse, the president victoriously defeats Clay in the 1832 election. So now Biddle and, and Clay, they, they went for the so-called two-point conversion, uh, and they came home empty-handed. They didn't get a bank, right? They lost its, re it lost its recharter, and they, uh, they didn't even get the election, right? So they, they, they didn't get either of their goals. And after the election, Van Buren writes to Jackson. He says, quote, the idea of the establishment of any bank in any of the states, referring to a central bank, is... I take it entirely done away with by the veto, right? So we've, this is not just a veto against the second bank of the United States, it's a veto against central banking. That's very important. And Jackson, in subsequent years, he said, quote, the hydra of corruption is only scotched, not dead, right? So Jackson literally called it a hydra, right? You've seen the picture, he's, that's a hydra, right? Jackson called, you know, he believed, truly believed it as a hydra. In 1833, Jackson removes the government's deposits. 
and the Hydra officially loses its recharter in 1836. So the central bank is, is basically whittled away, right? And in 1840, Jackson's presidential successor supports his call to separate the government from all banks. And his independent treasury, Jackson's original program, separates the government from banking by only accepting payments in specie. Right, it was a magnificent reform. Uh, it was probably our best system in the monetary sphere on the federal level between 1840 and 1860, when the federal government had the least involvement with banking. Very, uh, very important, all right? So just to wrap up, say Andrew Jackson's veto dealt a deadly blow to central banking in the United States. And using executive power has its pitfalls, as I talk about in cronyism, but it really seems to be the only effective way to enact reform, right? You got to attack cronyism through the executive branch. Congress really isn't going to do the heavy lifting, right? Legislative bodies are always going to want the goodies. So the, but the executive can combat with vetoes, as long as you got the right person in charge, so to speak. It's a tough job, but if you got that, uh, it's a little bit downhill from there, all right? So for the modern era, again, if we look at some successes in the United States during this time, you know, during our own, uh, you know, uh, life, uh, recently during COVID, it's really been through the executive branch, at least at the state level, um, through the executive branch. Okay. So to conclude, cronyism is must read for the origins of special interest legislation. It's a fantastic gift for Labor Day, Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and especially <laughs> Valentine's Day. Okay, so just keep it in mind. Um, at the very least, it cures insomnia. If you have trouble sleeping at night, you can open it up. <laughs> it's going to put you to bed just, just like that. It's going to be fantastic. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind. Uh, and it's also a nice paperweight. So, you know, it serves many purposes. Uh, and stay tuned for the sequel. So thank you very much.